Britain does owe reparations, this video is called. I think this is about the colonization that Britain did. I really don't know, but either way, leave a like if you want more videos like this and state your opinion in the comments below. I really want to read your opinions. I really need to know what other people feel about this. That's really what this video is all about. I want to see what others feel like and maybe perhaps I can state my opinion afterwards. I really don't know that much about this colonization to be honest. So I'm hoping to get enlightened by this video and perhaps afterwards I can say what I think if I have learned something afterwards because right now I really have no opinion because I really don't know anything about it. So hopefully afterwards I know so much that I can actually state my opinion and I need you to do so as well in the comments below. So the one having the speech is Shashi Taror. I really don't know how to pronounce that but apparently he's an Indian politician Politician. So I feel like he knows what he's talking about. This video is 15 minutes long. So we are in for a treat guys So let's jump right into this. So this is a speech I assume and it's called Britain does owe reparations So I assume it's going to be some kind of a rant. I really don't know. I'm just speculating. Let's jump right into this Wait, <laughs> look at that hair to the right. Holy shit, that's a lot of hair. Look at that. Wait, what? Is it orange at the front of the hair? That's a very interesting combination. First orange here and then very buff hair backwards. I, li I like it. It's, it's cool. Let's continue. I'm sorry, that wasn't even the focus of the video. I don't know why. Madam President, <clears throat> and gentlemen, ladies of the house. Oh, that's him. Doctor. I... Standing here with eight minutes uh, in my hands and uh, at this venerable and rather magnificent institution, I was going to assure you that I belong to the Henry VIII School of Public Speaking. That as Henry VIII said to his wives, I shall not keep you long. <laughs> but now well finding done. myself... Always good with jokes now finding before. myself the seventh speaker out of eight in what must already seem a rather long evening to you, I rather feel like Henry VIII's last wife. I more or less know what's expected of me, but I'm not sure how to do it any differently. <laughs> it's always good with jokes to lighten up the mood before. Well, perhaps what I should do is really try and pay attention to the arguments that were advanced by the opposition today. Okay. We had, for example, Sir Richard Ottaway suggesting, uh, challenging the very idea that it could be argued that the economic situation of the colonies was actually worsened by the experience of British colonialism. Well, I stand to offer you the Indian example, Sir Richard. India's share of the world economy when Britain arrived on its shores was 23%. By the time the British okay. left, it was down to below 4%. Why? Simply because India had been governed for the benefit of Britain. 23 to 4%. Britain's rise for 200 years was financed wow. by its depredations in India. In fact, Britain's industrial revolution was actually premised upon the deindustrialization of India. The handloom weavers, for example, famed That's across insane. the world, whose products Listen were exported around the world. Britain came right in. There were actually these weavers making fine muslin, light as woven air, it was said. And Britain came right in, smashed their thumbs, broke their looms, wow. imposed tariffs and duties on their cloth and products, and started, of course, uh, taking the raw materials from India and shipping back manufactured cloth, flooding the world's markets with what became the products of the dark and satanic mills of Victorian England. That uh, meant that the weavers in India became beggars, and India went from being a world-famous exporter of finished cloth into an importer, went from having 27% of world trade to, to less than 2%. 27 Meanwhile, to 2%? Only this like Robert wow. Clive bought their rotten boroughs in England on the proceeds of their loot in India, while taking the Hindi word loot into their dictionaries as well as their habits. Uh, <laughs> why I, I just got it. I, I didn't and understand the British that first. Had the That's goal awesome. To call him I think, I don't know. India as if he belonged to the country when all he really did was to ensure that much of the country belonged to him. <laughs> He's, he phrases his words awesome. By the end of the 19th awesome. century, the fact is that India was already Britain's biggest cash cow, the world's biggest purchaser of British goods and exports, and the source of highly paid employment for British civil servants. We literally paid for our own oppression. And as has been pointed out, the wealthy Victorian British families that made their money out of, out of the slave economy, one-fifth of, 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 the, of the elites of, of the wealthy class in Britain in the 19th century owed their money to transporting three million Africans across the waters. And in fact, in 1833, when slavery was abolished, what happened was that a compensation of 20 million pounds was paid 
not as reparations to those who had lost their lives or, or who had suffered or been oppressed by slavery, but okay. to those who had lost their property. I was struck by the fact that your <laughs> Wi-Fi password at this union commemorates the name of Mr. Gladstone, the great liberal hero. Well, I'm sorry, his family was one of those who benefited from, the, from this compensation. That's, so he wrote that part Staying after coming India, to this. 15 That's awesome. And 29 million Indians died of starvation in British-induced famines. The most famous example, of course, was the Great Bengal Famine during the Second World War, when four million people died because Winston Churchill deliberately, as a matter of written minuted policy, proceeded to divert essential supplies from civilians in Bengal to sturdy Tommies and Europeans uh, as reserve stockpiles. He said that the starvation of any way underfed Bengalis mattered much less than that of sturdy Greeks. This is Churchill's actual quote, and when conscious stricken British actual officials quote. wrote to him, pointing out that people were dying because of this, of this decision, he peevishly wrote in the margins of the file, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? So all notions that the British Did he really? were trying to do their colonial enterprise out of really despotism to try and bring the benefits of, of colonialism and civilization to the benighted heathen. I'm sorry. Churchill's conduct in 43, simply one example of many that gave a lie to this myth. As others have said and on the proposition, violence and racism were the reality of the colonial experience. And no wonder that the sun never sat, set on the British Empire, because even God couldn't trust the English in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Let me take He's World such War a good as a, as a very concrete example since the first speaker, Mr. Lee, suggested these things couldn't be quantified. Well, let me quantify World War I for you. Again, I'm sorry, from an Indian perspective, others have spoken of other countries. One-sixth of all the British forces that fought on the war were Indian. 54,000 Indians actually lost their lives in that war. 65,000 were wounded. Another 4,000 remained missing or in prison. Indian taxpayers had to cough up 100 million pounds in that time's money. What? India supplied 70 million rounds of ammunition, 600,000 rifles and machine guns, 42 million garments were stitched and sent out of India, and 1.3 million Indian personnel served in this war. I know all this because, of course, the, the, the commemoration of the centenary has just taken place. But not just that, India had to supply 173,000 animals, 370 yeah. million tons of supplies, and in the end, the total value of everything that was taken out of India. India and India, by the way, suffering from recession at that time and poverty and hunger yeah, that's was in today's money, eight billion pounds. You want the problem with this is that I can't speak while he's talking. I probably forget what he said afterwards. So I might have to pause throughout it all. But like, listen to the numbers that he's saying, like the percentage, all of these money numbers. It's insane. It truly is. He's such a good man with words as well, like making jokes while actually stating facts. He's, it's awesome. Quantification, it's available. Second World War. It was even worse. Two and a half million Indians in uniform. I won't belabor the point. But of Britain's total war debt of three billion pounds in 1945 money, 1.25 billion was owed to India and never actually paid. Somebody mentioned Scotland. Well, the fact is that colonialism actually cemented your union with Scotland. You know, the Scots had actually tried to send colonies out uh, before 1707. They'd all failed, I'm sorry to say. But then, of course, came union and India was available and there you had a disproportionate employment of Scots, I'm sorry Mr. Mackenzie has to speak after me, engaged in this colonial enterprise I guess, as yeah. soldiers, as merchants, as agents, as employees, and the earnings from India is what brought prosperity to Scotland, even pulled, pulled Scotland out of poverty. Now that India is no longer there, no wonder the bonds are loosening. Wow. Now, we've heard other arguments it's on this side. Shots. There's been a, a mention of the railways. <laughs> well, let me tell you, first of all, as my colleague, the Jamaican That's High off. Commission, has pointed out, uh, railways and roads were really built to serve British interests and not those of the local people. But I might add that many countries have built railways and roads without having had to be colonized in order to do so. Uh, they... yeah, wow. <laughs> they were designed to carry raw materials from the hinterland into the ports to be shipped to Britain. 
And the fact is that the Indian or Jamaican or other colonial public, their needs were incidental. Transportation, there was no attempt made to match supply to demand for mass transport, none whatsoever. Instead, in fact, the Indian railways were built with massive incentives offered by Britain to British investors, guaranteed out of Indian taxes paid by Indians. That's insane. With the result that you actually had one mile of Indian railway costing twice what it cost to build the same mile in Canada or Australia because there was so much money being paid in extravagant returns. Britain made all the profits, controlled the technology, supplied all the equipment, and absolutely all these benefits came as private enterprise, <laughs> My voice. British See. private enterprise, at public risk, Insane. Indian public risk. That was the, the, the railways as an accomplishment. <clears throat> We're hearing about aid. I think it was, uh, it was, it was again, Sir Richard Ottawa mentioned uh, uh, British aid to India. Well, let me just point out that British aid to India is about 0.4% of India's GDP. The government of India actually spends more on fertilizer subsidies, which might be an appropriate metaphor for that argument. Wow, that's what I mean. Like, he's, he's playing with words and stating facts. He just melds perfectly, and he makes it so good. Like, he's firing shots in all these good ways. That's awesome. If I may point out as well, if I may point out as well that, um, that as my fellow speakers from the proposition have pointed out, there have been incidents of racial violence, of loot, of massacres, of bloodshed, of transportation, in India's case, even of one of our, our last Mughal emperor. Yes, maybe today's Britons are not responsible for some of these depredations, but the That's same speakers well. are pointed with pride to their foreign aid. You're not responsible for the people starving in Somalia, but you give them aid. Surely the principle of reparations for what is for the wrongs that have been done cannot be denied. It's been pointed yeah. out, for example, the dehumanization yeah. of Africans in the Caribbean, the massive psychological damage that has been done, the undermining of social traditions, of property rights, of, of the authority structures of these societies, all in the interests of, of, of British colonialism. And the fact remains that many of today's problems in these countries, including the persistence, in some cases, the creation of racial and ethnic and religious tensions, were the direct result of the colonial experience. So there is a moral debt that needs to be paid. Okay, okay. Someone challenged I see. Uh, reparations elsewhere. Well, I'm sorry, Germany doesn't just give reparations to Israel. It also gave reparations to Poland. Perhaps some of the speakers here are too young to remember the dramatic picture of Chancellor Willy Brandt on his knees in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1970. And there are other examples. There is uh, Italy's reparations to Libya. There's Japan's to Korea. Even Britain has paid reparations to the New Zealand Maoris. So it's not as if this is something unprecedented or unheard of that's going to somehow open some sort of nasty Pandora's box. <laughs> no wonder Professor Lewis reminded us that he's from Texas. There's a wonderful expression in Texas that summarizes the arguments of the opposition. What All is hat it? and no cattle. <laughs> oh, now, I didn't understand that one. If I can just quickly look through the other notes I was scribbling while they were speaking. There was reference to democracy and rule of law. Let me say with the greatest possible respect, you can, it's a bit rich to oppress, enslave, kill, torture, maim people for 200 years That's and then brutal. celebrate the fact that they're democratic at the end of it. We... Wow. That's what I mean. It, like the way he... he oh my. We were denied democracy, sir. We had to snatch yeah, exactly. it from you. With the greatest <laughs> reluctance, it was conceded in India's case after 150 years of British rule, and that too with limited franchise. Yes, indeed, ma'am. The opposition spoke quite highly of Greek and Athenian democracy on which the West should pride itself and spoke of liberty and equality in that same name. The Athenian democracy was only functioning because of the slave society on which it was built. <laughs> That's the nature of colonization. All right, I don't think that needs, uh, needs contradiction, not from me at any rate. Yeah, exactly. He, he's not going to. <laughs> but but if, I, if, I may just, if I may just point out, I think that's the basically argument what he's made saying. by a couple of the speakers, the first speaker, Mr. Lee in particular, conceded all the evil atrocities of colonialism, but essentially suggested that reparations won't really help, they won't help the right people, they'll be used as a propaganda tool, they'll embolden people like Mr. Mugabe. It's always nice how in the old days, you know, uh, I'm sorry to say that. Uh, the, the people of the Caribbean used to 
frighten their children into behaving and sleeping by saying Sir Francis Drake would come after them. Oh. That was a legacy of that. Yes. Of that. Now, now it's Mugabe will be there. So this is the, the new sort of Sir Francis Drake of our times. I didn't the, fact is, the fact is very simply, sir, that we are not talking about reparations as a tool to empower anybody. They're a tool for you to atone for the wrongs that have been done. That's awesome. And that's I, a way. Yeah, exactly. I was happy. That's, that's such a good way to phrase it. quite prepared to accept the proposition that you can't evaluate, put, a, put a, a monetary sum on the kinds of horrors people have suffered. Certainly no amount of money can expiate the loss of a loved one, as, as somebody pointed out there. Uh, you're not going to be able to figure out an exact amount. But the principle is what matters. The fact is that to speak blithely of sacrifices on both sides, uh, as an uh, uh, analogy was used here, a burglar comes into your house, ransacks the place, stubs his toe, and you say, well, he, there was a sacrifice on both sides. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, is not an acceptable, is not an acceptable like argument. Um, the truth is that um, we are not arguing specifically that vast sums of money need to be paid. The I think it's lost in his before this house is the principle of owing reparations, not the fine points of how much is owed, to whom it should be paid. The question is, is there a debt? Does Britain owe reparations? Okay, as far that's as awesome. I'm concerned, and that's yes. The ability to acknowledge a wrong that has been done, to simply say sorry, will go a far, far, far longer way that's than awesome. some percentage of GDP in, 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 form, in the form of, of, of aid. What is required, it seems to me, is accepting the principle that reparations are owed. Personally, I'd be quite happy if it was one pound a year for the next 200 years after the last 200 years of Britain and India. Thank you very much, Madam President. He is an insanely talented speaker, by the way. This was the first speech I've ever seen from him, but holy shit, he's good at his words. Like, as I said, he, like, almost uses, like, jokes when he some stated some facts to fire shots and build his argument up at the same time, and that's such a good way to do it. So what he's talking about is that they won't acknowledge, basically. Like, it's not fair play from their part. They, they like, enslaved, tortured, murdered in these 200 years. And, and then they're claiming that they helped India grow instead. If that's what I understood. Like, I knew nothing about this before. And after listening to this speech, I feel like I know all of it. Obviously, the speech is biased. But he did bring up some arguments that they said and then countered them himself. So I've, I've heard, like, basically both sides of this. If they pay money, it doesn't go to the right people because the people back then are dead and stuff like that but but then he also like fired back with counter arguments and that's what's really good about this that's what you should do in a debate as well you should bring up some arguments and then counter them to completely destroy your opponent basically and that's exactly what he did here i can't imagine how how it must be going up against him afterwards in favor of britain like, i don't see how anyone would be able to like defend britain after his speech like that by the way i absolutely love his glasses like they're hanging down and they're like split i don't know if he connects them and then they turn into glasses that he can use but <laughs> they look so awesome there they kind of took a little bit of my concentration away but still and as he is saying there is a moral debt to be paid i agree at least from what i've heard and from what i've learned about this like obviously i knew a little bit about it before but definitely not as much as he told me in this like he brought up numbers people dying 200 years people getting tortured that india was an exporter of products and afterwards became an importer because of how badly they were struck and then people still after all of those arguments still say that britain helped india in their growth by creating railroads and he also mentioned like these railroads cost twice as much as in if they were built in Canada and stuff like that that's insane like he knows everything he's talking about he knows the facts he even has puns and yokes to fire shots at them and he's just such a good speaker he really knows how to turn the audience to his side brings up counter argument he brings in yokes his speech is so good he brings he brings in facts like no one can like i don't know how anyone would be able to debate against this and i feel like he brought up a lot of 
big counter arguments as well. It's not like some small witty that doesn't really make sense. Like these counter arguments were big and he still managed to say that they, there's like a moral depth to be owed. There's also some jokes that I didn't understand like like that Texas joke, all hats no cattle or something like that. And I feel like a lot of other people must have missed that as well because not as many people shared there but I really didn't understand that joke. He also said that they tortured oppressed the main people for 200 and years and then that they celebrated that there was democracy formed afterwards. That's a, such a good example of the way he plays with words. It makes them into like half jokes but, but also is stating facts and like firing shots. It's such a good way of him to have a speech. I am obviously biased so I would like to hear someone argue against what he said so to hear both sides and that could be very interesting I feel like. Either way, thank you, leave a like.